بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اكيدك لا تنادي فهمه يا بني قومي اسودا اعيد debate is, is Jesus God according to the four biblical gospels? Taking the affirmative position will be Kibane the Christian, and taking the negative position will be Sami Zatari. And the format of the debate will be two minutes introduction, ten minute opening statements, seven minute rebuttals, five minute second rebuttals, twenty minute crossfire, two minutes each for each uh, debater, and three minute closing statements and 30 minute q a so with that said um Cabane, are you ready hello Cabane. and sammy zatari are you ready okay so uh Cabane, you may begin your introduction all right thank you mk so right now I just want to introduce the debate. Hello everyone, this is Cabane the Christian. The subject of tonight's debate is the deity of Jesus according to the biblical gospels. Now let me state what the debate is not about. It's not about the logical coherency of the incarnation. It's not about the inspiration of the Bible. It's not about the reliability of the gospels. It's not about the inspiration of the Quran or the prophet of Muhammad. Therefore, if any of these subjects are brought up by Mr. Zatari, I will dismiss them and stay on topic. In this introduction, my intention is to explain the basic Christian doctrine that I will be defending. God is one being who eternally exists in three centers of consciousness, known as persons. We as humans are one being who exists in one center of consciousness, but there is nothing contradictory about a being who exists in three centers of consciousness. These three persons are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is not God the Father. Jesus Christ is not God the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is God the Son. These are all distinct persons who are separate in personhood, but they are one in being. When God the Son became a man, his eternal divine nature united with the temporal human nature. The divine nature did not become human. The human nature did not become divine. The divine nature is eternal. The human nature is not eternal. These two distinct natures were united in the one person of Jesus Christ, but the two natures do not mix. They remain distinct. Therefore, we do not worship a man because we only worship his divine nature and not his human nature. At the Incarnation, Jesus gave up the free use of some of his divine attributes, using them only at the pleasure of God the Father. Therefore, when Jesus chose not to access his divine nature, he was limited. Remember this, because I am certain that Mr. Zatari will ignore this statement and attempt to prove from Jesus' human nature that Jesus was not God. But remember that Jesus' human and divine natures are distinct, and remember that we worship only his divine nature, and only his divine nature are honored as eternal. Finally, remember the resolution. I am to prove from the four biblical gospels, that is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that Jesus is God. I am not limited to the words of Christ himself, but whatever is written in the four Gospels. With that said, I cede the mic to Mr. Zatari and look forward to the debate. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sammy left the room, and he just came back. Uh, you missed part of the introduction. I don't know if Sammy wants to hear it again, or I don't know what you guys want to do. Sammy, do you want to hear the introduction again, or do you want to just continue with your introduction? All right, Mike is free. Hello, everyone. MK, MK, are you go to moderate this debate on me? MK, please save me. Both of you. It cannot be both of you. It cannot be. All right. No problem for me. McVeigh, 
you want to go to the Is Mr. Zatari still here? Or is he just away from the keyboard? Okay, do you want to hear the introduction again or do you want to um or do you want to go with your introduction right now? Sammy, are you going to take the mic? Uh, we're waiting for you to make your introduction, so please come on the mic. just happened? Did he leave the room? Okay, okay, there you go. Brother Sammy, he have a problem with connection. Inshallah, we come with uh, Skype. Inshallah. Hulkaster, brother Hulkaster, brother Hulkaster, are you here, Miyaki? Okay, am I on the microphone? Can I be heard to MK and to Brother Sultan? Can I, okay, you see, you see, we have everything. We have so many backups that it doesn't matter if there are some technical difficulties. We have everything covered. So now I can begin. And Kabain, I heard most of your presentation, your opening, so that's okay. Uh, I just got disconnected in the last 10 seconds. Now, sometimes my Pal Talk Express just shuts down for no reason. And usually I'll be back in 20 seconds, but since I'm on Skype with my friend, it shouldn't be a problem since I'll see through him and he can inform you if I get disconnected. So now I'll begin my uh, presentation, two minute presentation. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, my name is uh, Sami Zaktari. I run my own website, muslim-responses.com. I also run my YouTube channel, Sami Zaktari, where I discuss a wide range of issues on Christianity, politics, atheism, and most of my polemic work, most of my articles on Christianity, defending Islam, can be found on muslim-responses.com. Now, what I'll be doing in tonight's debate is to be showing that, according to the four Gospels, Jesus is not God, and that there's really no strong evidence for you to believe 
such a claim. And that's what I hope to be able to show all of you today. Now, I've been basically doing this for the past five years, debating, writing articles, and so that's what I do. I entered this when I was 18 years old, and I love having interfaith discussions, interfaith debates, and as Kebane said, tonight's debate is on Jesus. I'm not going to bring up the Prophet Muhammad. I'm not going to argue against the Bible's integrity. I, I hardly ever do that when I debate this topic, so you don't need to worry about that. I'm going to be dealing with the text that he brings up, whether it makes sense with the theology of the Abrahamic God, and basically that is my presentation, so I hope all of you enjoy tonight's debate, and please everybody, leave your biasness out the window. Keep it outside and just listen to both sides, listen to the arguments, and then decide for yourselves. Don't decide before you haven't even heard a single argument being made. That's what I'd ask all of you to do. And please, bring your notes out. And I'm done. Off the mic. Okay, so now this is my 10-minute opening, and just to uh, tell everyone... Excuse me. Okay. Um, I will divide the evidence from the Bible that Jesus Christ is God into three categories. First, Christ claims the divine title, I am. Second, Christ claims the divine title, Wisdom of God. And third, Christ claims the divine title, Son of Man. In the four Gospels, Jesus claims to be the great I am of the Old Testament. Uh, wait. Do we have, can we have a one? Can we have a one? Can we have a one? Okay, um, could we stop time right now? Because I need to confirm that Mr. Zatari can hear me. Oh, hello, everyone. Sam and Zatari have a problem with connection. We hear you very good. You don't have no problem. All right? We, we hear you. Uh, do you hear me, Sammy? Sammy, you hear me? All right, uh, Mike Vane, you can take the mic and you start from the beginning. Uh, Holy Custer, please start some time from the beginning. For 10 minutes, please. Holy Custer, all right? Stop, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Satari. I will now explain the clear evidence from the biblical gospels that Jesus Christ is God. I'll divide the evidence into three categories. First, Christ claims the divine title, I am. Second, Christ claims the divine title, Wisdom of God. Third, Christ claims the divine title, Son of Man. In the four Gospels, Jesus Christ claims to be the great I am of the Old Testament. I want to look at the references Jesus makes. We begin in John chapter 8, John 8, 39, 40. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the same thing that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard, that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. In this passage, Jesus states that the Jews are seeking to kill him, but Abraham did not seek to kill him. How did Abraham refuse to kill Jesus if Jesus did not actually exist at the time of Abraham? Let us look further in John 8 to answer this question. Jesus says, John 8, 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now Jesus is claiming that Abraham saw Christ himself. What is Jesus talking about? In order to figure this out, we must look at the title given to Jesus in John chapter 1. John writes, John 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John gives Jesus the title of Word of God. Contrary to popular belief, this title is also claimed by Jesus himself. The Logos of God is equivalent to the Wisdom of God. In Jewish doctrine, Jesus... Uh, in Jewish doctrine. And Jesus calls himself the wisdom of God. Matthew 11:19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. 
Here we see that Jesus Christ claims to be justified by his deeds. He equates himself with divine wisdom, a title meaning the same as the Logos. Therefore, we will look for Jesus' appearance to Abraham in the Old Testament scripture. Genesis 15.1 After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Note here that the word of Yahweh comes to Abraham in a vision. This is not merely the message of Yahweh, but a person called the word. Messages come in the ear, but the word of Yahweh actually appears to Abraham. In addition, in Genesis 15.5 it says, And he, the word, brought him outside. The word of Yahweh is leading Abraham outside. The word here is clearly a visible person, not just the message of Yahweh. Let us continue to Genesis 15.2. Genesis 15.2. But Abram said, O Yahweh God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And here is the key point. Abraham refers to the word of Yahweh as Yahweh God. Thus we see that Jesus Christ claims to be the word of Yahweh who appeared to Abraham. And since Abraham called the word of Yahweh Yahweh God, this is a clear identification of Jesus Christ with Yahweh God. Let us continue in John 8. John 8, 57 to 58. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Thus, Jesus Christ has just claimed to be the eternal divine word of Yahweh who appeared to Abraham. Then he makes a claim to be Ego I me, or I am, which is a divine title. What is interesting is that this translates into Hebrew as Anihu. Whereas Anihu spoken of in the Hebrew scriptures, it is never, ever used of anyone but Yahweh. Thus, Jesus alludes to God's words in the prophet Isaiah, where he says, I am God. Let us continue with more of Jesus' I am statements. Jesus says in John 4.26, I am the one who is speaking to you. What is this an allusion to? Well, in the book of Isaiah, Yahweh uses almost the exact same words. He says in Isaiah 52.6, I am the one who is speaking. Thus, Christ appropriates the language used by Yahweh God alone through the prophet Isaiah and applies it to himself. This is a powerful claim to deity. Let us look at one more example from John 6.20. Jesus says in John 6.20, I am, do not be afraid. Jesus says this to the apostles when there is a storm in the waters, and they are afraid in their boat. Yahweh says in Isaiah 43.2 and 5, When you pass through the waters, do not be afraid, for I am. Yet again, we see that Jesus Christ appropriates the specific claims and statements made by Yahweh alone in the book of Isaiah and applies these statements to himself. Importantly, it is not simply the I am statement alone, but Jesus appropriates the surrounding context of the Old Testament passages, which leaves no doubt of the claims that he makes. Another important title that Jesus uses is the wisdom of God. He makes numerous allusions to ancient Jewish wisdom texts, canonical, deuterocanonical, and uncanonical, and applies these statements to himself. Let us first look at Proverbs chapter 8, Yahweh present, where wisdom says, Yahweh possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from the everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. As we can see, the wisdom of God is an eternal person, distinct from the Father, yet eternally existing, and therefore also divine. Derek Kidney in his book, The Wisdom of Proverbs, Job and Ecclesiastes, says, Wisdom makes claims for herself which are elsewhere made only by or only for God. Before I demonstrate that Jesus is divine, made divine wisdom made flesh, let me answer an objection in advance. I am almost certain that Mr. Zatari is planning to attack the fact that divine wisdom is shown as a female, while Jesus Christ is male. God's divine nature is genderless, and he metaphorically describes himself with female and male characteristics. For example, Isaiah 46.3, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, from all the, remnant, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. Jesus Christ metaphorically describes himself as a female hen, Matthew 23.3. 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. Now that we have established that wisdom is a divine person, distinct from the Father, yet still divine, let us look at the passages where Jesus is identified with divine wisdom gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. Now that we have established that wisdom is a divine person, distinct from the Father, yet still divine, let us look at the passages where Jesus is identified with divine wisdom. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 29-30, Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. light. Listen to these words in the book of Sirach, describing wisdom. Sirach 6, 19, 31. 
Come to wisdom like one who plows and sows. Put your neck into her collar. Bind your shoulders and carry her. Come unto her with all your soul and keep her ways with all your might. For at last you will find the rest she gives. Then her fetters will become for you a strong defense and her collar a glorious robe. Her yoke is a golden ornament, and her bonds a purple cord. Jesus Christ identifies himself with the characteristics of divine wisdom. Jesus explicitly calls himself the wisdom of God in Luke chapter 11, verse 49. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. Here are two more brief examples of Jesus' identification with divine wisdom in the book of wisdom. John 6, 27. Uh, I, I'm trying just to read it quickly instead of posting straight. John, I will post one request. Do not John 6, 27. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Wisdom, 16, 26. On wisdom God the Father has placed his seal of approval, so that your children, whom you loved, O Lord, might learn that it is not the production of crops that feeds humankind, but that your word sustains those who trust in you. John 14, 15. If you love me, Jesus Christ, you will keep my commandments. Wisdom, 16, 18. And the love of wisdom is the keeping of her laws, and giving heed to her laws is the assurance of immortality. Therefore, we see that wisdom is a divine figure, God, and Jesus Christ claims to be divine wisdom. I want to briefly also cover Jesus' use, I'll start to slow down, Jesus' use of the title, Son of Man. Jesus claims to be the Son of Man 78 times in the New Testament Gospels. Here are a few examples. John 1, 51. And he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Mark 14, 21. For the Son of Man goes as it, is, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Who is this Son of Man? To answer this question, we will go to the book of Daniel. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. It is important to note that in the Gospels and in the book of Daniel, the title used for Son of Man is Bar Enosh, whereas in the book of Ezekiel, where the title Son of Man is used negatively, it is Bar Adam. The Son of Man is a divine figure. How do we know this? We see worship being offered to him, and and second of all, Jesus says, Matthew 26, 64-65, Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further wit witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. Why would the high priest think this was blasphemous if Jesus was not claiming divinity? Jesus is claiming divinity when he says that he will be seated at the right hand of power. What did this mean? In the Apocryphal Testament of Job, which reflects ancient Jewish belief, the right hand of God is where the very power of Yahweh emanates from. The righteous prophets of old are allowed to stand at the right hand of God and sit at his left hand, but they are never allowed to sit at the right hand of God. This means that Jesus Christ is claiming the same divine authority that Yahweh God alone claims. Names. Therefore, because of these three categories of evidence, because of the wisdom of God, because of I am, because of the Son of Man, it is best to conclude that Jesus Christ claims deity according to the New Testament Gospels. I have additional lines of evidence that I will bring forth in my next few speeches. Thank you. Make sure, MK. And oh, wait one second. Okay, now is the sound good? No echo. Just give me a one. Okay, you can start my time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So to proceed, is Jesus God according to the four Gospels? Is he divine? Do these four Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John preach about the divinity of Christ? Well, for starters, these four Gospels are the four supposed eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. They are the four eyewitness accounts of his life. Hence, if Jesus is God, one would readily expect to find a single, a single passage 
which quotes Jesus as saying, I am God, or I am the only God, and there is no God but me. But surprise, surprise, there is not a single passage in which Jesus says, I am God, or I am the only God, etc. Now, how is that possible? Here we are debating whether Jesus is God. And the very man himself, Jesus, never made such a statement. So my question to everyone is this. Who are you going to believe? My opponent, Thomas, who argues that yes, Jesus is God, or Jesus himself, the man who never uttered the words, I am God. Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. So I will lay down the first challenge of tonight's debate. And I demand that it be met. And if it is not met, then we can happily go to bed tonight knowing that Jesus is not God. And the challenge is very simple. Bring me a single explicit and clear verse which records Jesus saying the following. I am Yahweh, I am God. Or, I am Yahweh, and there is no other God beside me. So that is my first challenge for tonight's debate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what do we know about God? We know that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all all-knowledgeable. He doesn't die, etc., etc. Yet, according to the Gospels, Jesus was not all-powerful. He was ignorant just like we are all ignorant, and he died. All of these traits are not the traits of God. The fact that Jesus is not all-powerful proves he is not God. The fact that Jesus is not, not, is not all-knowing proves that he is not God. And the very fact that Jesus died proves he is not God. Now, I can already read the minds of the Christians and my opponents. Now, the standard Christian response to this problem is the following. Ah, yes, you see, Jesus is fully man and fully God. He is the God-man. For starters, calling Jesus the God-man, or claiming Jesus to be fully God and fully man, is as useless as me saying 2 plus 2 equals 17. It means absolutely nothing. It is 100% wrong. Now, you can say it, but it doesn't mean anything. How can you be fully 100% God and 100% man at the same time? How can you be all-knowing and ignorant at the same time? Ladies and gentlemen, if I told you someone was fully fat and fully thin, would that make sense? What about fully smart and fully dumb at the same time? Or better fully truthful but fully dishonest at the same time it would be it would make no sense I would be talking gibberish now I'm sure many Christians will be shaking their heads in disagreement so let me lay down my second challenge bring me a single verse from the four Gospels the four Gospels which explicitly and clearly record Jesus stating that he is fully God and fully man. Bring me a single verse where Jesus says, I am the God-man. Now, since time is short, I will go on this final point. If I have some final minutes left, I'll go to other points. Now, here we are tonight debating whether Jesus is God or not. But what about Jesus' contemporaries, the people who lived with Jesus? What about them? What about the people who, are, who were alive during his lifetime? And the people who believed in him? What did they debate about? Did they debate what we are debating right now? Did they debate whether Jesus... What about the people who, are, who were alive during his lifetime? and the people who believed in him. What did they debate about? Did they debate what we are debating right now? Did they debate whether Jesus was God or just a prophet? Well, guess what? 
these guys used to debate on whether Jesus was the Messiah or the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18. That's what they used to debate with each other. And here is the reference from John chapter 7, verses 40 to 41. Let me read it for you. When some of the people heard his words, they said, This man must be a prophet, the one we've been expecting. Others said, He is the Christ. Still, other asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Notice, these guys were even debating each other and putting rebuttals to each other. How can he be the Christ? He's from Galilee. And the other said, He is the prophet we've been expecting. And that is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. So why in the world are we debating whether Jesus is God or not, when his own followers didn't debate such things? But rather they debated if he was the Messiah or the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Now isn't that interesting? In the supposed most Christological gospel out of them all, John, you have a bunch of people debating whether he is the prophet or the Christ. Now, if that's not interesting, I don't know what is. And that's straight from the gospel. Now, since I have time, I'll continue to other points. Now, here we are tonight. Here we are. All of us sitting here debating whether Jesus is God. But think about this. What an irony. The man who we're debating, who is supposedly God, he himself has a God. How in the world is Jesus God when he himself has a God, a God he cried and prayed to? Let's just look at the Gospels and take what we see. And let's leave the Trinitarian interpretation at the window. I'm just going to tell you the facts that are from the Gospels. And here are the facts, my friends. Jesus has a God. Jesus prayed to God. Jesus ate. Jesus slept. Jesus was not all-knowing. Jesus died. Now put all of that together. Put all of this together. Do you really believe that Jesus is God? Put all the fancy interpretation to the side and just take the text and take what it's telling you. Everything I just mentioned. If you were alive during Jesus' lifetime, my friends, let's say you were one of his disciples and you were beside him and you saw him praying and crying to God, would you really take this man as your God, the one you pray to? Would you do such a thing? Honestly, ask yourself that question. But again, I'm sure the Christians will be disagreeing with me, specifically the Trinitarians. But remember, remember, I put the challenge down. Show me a single verse where Jesus says, I am fully God and fully man. I am the God-man. Because that's your interpretation to all these problems I just brought up. Now, if you can't bring this verse as clearly as I just asked, then nobody should listen to you or any other Trinitarian and should simply conclude with the obvious fact that this man who never claimed to be God was not God. That this man prayed to God because he was just a man like all of us. Now anyway, I've disconnected from Paltalk, but I'm still on Skype and I have a minute left let me end on a final point on the Trinity. As Cobain said, there's three persons. But now I have a question for all of you and for Cobain. Is Jesus the Father? Obviously he's not. Is Jesus the Father and is the Father Jesus and is both of them, are both of them the Holy Spirit? The answer is no. Each one of these persons are different persons. Jesus is not the Father. The Father is not Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is neither. So therefore, you have three actual persons, none of them are each other, and each is fully God, according to Thomas. So how many gods are you left with? So in fact, here's a third challenge for you. Bring me a single verse from the four Gospels where Jesus said, 
where Jesus said, God is one in three, or God is made up of three persons. Because last I checked in the Gospel of Mark, when somebody came up to Jesus, what, was, what did Jesus say? There is only one God. All right, thank you for that, Mr. Zatari. Now let's deal with this, these statements that you made. The first thing I want to do is I want to address your objection about the Holy Trinity. You said that there are three distinct persons. How can there be? How can they be one God? They are one God because uh, the Son is eternally begotten of the Father and eternally partakes of the Father's essence, and that is why He is God. And the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and takes the Father's essence, and that is why He is God. It is because the Spirit and the Son eternally partake of the essence of the Father that they are deity. Okay, because they are one in being, but three in personhood. This does not mean that there are three gods. To say that there are three gods would mean that there are three beings, but there are three persons, one being. So you simply, again, you misunderstand the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't understand the relationship between the persons of the Trinity. Now, let's address your challenge. You said, if Jesus is God, one would readily expect to find a single passage which quotes Jesus as saying, I am God. We must have this, or we know that Jesus is not God. Well, Mr. Zatari, Theos, the Greek for God, is not the only title that God uses. You remember in my opening statement, I stated that wisdom of God is clearly a title for God because Yahweh is called divine wisdom in the Old Testament. So the question, does Jesus explicitly call himself a title of God, wisdom of God? The answer has been given in my opening statement, Luke 11:49. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. So yes, Jesus does say quite explicitly, I am God, because he uses the divine title, wisdom of theos, which is clearly a divine title as proved in the Old Testament. And remember, wisdom is equated to logos, and so what is logos? God's called in the Old Testament. It's called Yahweh. Genesis 15.2 calls the word O Yahweh. So this is simple. Jesus does claim to be divine because he uses divine titles of himself. Wisdom is a divine title. Jesus says, I am wisdom. And therefore, he does claim explicitly to be God. Again, your next challenge. Show me a passage where Jesus claims to be both God and man. This is a ridiculous challenge. If Jesus claims to be a man in the New Testament, then he's a man. And if he claims to be God in the New Testament, then he's God. And if he claims to be both in the New Testament, then he's the God-man. And it's obvious, that, and the Muslims will admit that Jesus claimed in the New Testament to be man. And the Christians argue that Jesus claimed to be God. And I have proven this, and he does. Uh, so therefore, Jesus is the God-man from the uh, New Testament itself. Now, Mr. Zatari next said that Jesus not being all-knowing proves that Jesus was not God. Now, I would like to challenge Mr. Zatari to pr provide the verse where Jesus is not all-knowing, and I know precisely the verse he's going to provide, so just provide that, and I will respond to this in my next rebuttal. He said, Jesus' death proves he's not God. Well, this is simple. Only Jesus' human nature died. Jesus' divine nature never ceased to exist. So you simply, again, misunderstand the doctrine of the hypostatic human Union. You say that saying Jesus is fully God and fully man is useless because they are contradictory. But you misunderstand this. It would be contradictory if we said the divine nature was human. Because, of course, the human nature of Jesus is limited and the divine nature is unlimited. But we are not saying that the divine nature of Jesus is human. We are saying that there are distinct natures that are united in one person and that sometimes Jesus accesses his only his human nature and sometimes he accesses his divine nature. So they, they are a union of natures. They are not a meshing of natures. Your point would only be valid if it was a meshing of natures rather than a union of natures. You say, uh, what about the people who were alive during Jesus' lifetime? Did they debate what we were debating? Did they say Jesus was God? Well, they said Jesus was a prophet. They said he was the Messiah. And I affirm that Jesus was a prophet and the Messiah. I remember the threefold office. Jesus is prophet, priest, king. I affirm Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the Messiah. So this is not a point against us. And what did the people in Jesus' time say? I asked nobody I am me during this. That's a kind of annoying. Uh, so what did the people in Jesus' time say Jesus was? Well, all we have to do is go to John chapter 20, verse 28. Thomas answered him. He's speaking to Jesus. My Lord, my God. So we do see the closest people to Jesus, the apostles, not just followers who had heard of him, but the people who knew him through his entire ministry, said, so we do see the closest people to Jesus, the apostles, not just followers who had heard of him, but the people who knew him through his entire ministry, said, My Lord and my God. What does Jesus say? Does he say, You blasphemer! Don't call me Lord and God. Worship only the Father. No. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus blesses Thomas's statement that Jesus is God. The people who knew Jesus the closest did believe in his deity. Mr. Zatari states, How is Jesus God when Jesus has a God whom he prayed to? Again, the Father and the Son are distinct persons. Jesus prays to the Father. Jesus prays to the Father. This does not mean that Jesus is not God. This means that they are both God, and because the Father and Son are one in being, this does not mean polytheism. Jesus has a God, but no. Jesus, Jesus, when Jesus is talking to Mary, he says, My God and your God, my Father and your Father. Why does he make a distinction? Why doesn't he simply say, Our God and our Father? It is a distinction made because Je the Father is Jesus' God by nature. The Father is Jesus' Father by nature. The Father is our God by adoption, and our Father by adoption. And so Jesus makes a distinction between the fatherhood in relation to Jesus Christ and the fatherhood in relation to the people. You say, he ate, he slept, he was not all-knowing, and he died. Well, he ate and slept because that's his human nature, not his divine nature. Remember, the human nature retains all its person, all its attributes, it unites with the divine nature, but does not become the divine nature. Likewise, the divine nature unites in one person with the human nature, but does not become the human nature. They remain distinct. He died, again, this is simply the human nature of Jesus uh, that died. Now I want to, since I have three minutes left, I want to go on to some, uh, some other arguments. You Muslims, you claim that Jesus or that Jesus was a faithful Muslim. So consider this. Jesus says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is not merely truth, nor does he merely bear truth, but Jesus Christ is the truth, in Arabic, al-haq. What is interesting is what the Quran says in Surah 22, 6, 62. That is because Allah is the truth, and that which they call upon other him is falsehood, and because Allah is the Most High, the Grand. Yet Christ claims to be the truth. Muslims claim that Jesus Christ was a prophet of Islam, and therefore believes everything caught in the Quran. So, if Jesus believes that God alone is al-Haq, yet claims to be al-Haq himself, what does that tell you? If you claim that Jesus never really said this, then you are implicitly admitting that Jesus is claiming deity according to the biblical gospels, and therefore have lost the debate. But I can see your objection in advance. Couldn't every prophet claim to be the way, the truth, and the life? Not according to Islam. In fact, in 922 AD, a Sufi by the name of Al-Halaj made the same claim. And what did Muslims of that day do? They crucified him for blasphemy, because God alone is the truth. So how did that fit in with Jesus Christ's claim to be the truth? I don't think it does. Now let's look at some other Quranic passages and see how they compare to Jesus' statements to be God. The Quran says in Surah 1940, It is we, Allah, who will inherit the earth, and all beings thereon. To us will they all be returned. Jesus Christ speaks of himself in a parable in Mark 12, 6 through 7. He, he had still one another, a beloved son. Finally, they sent he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son, Jesus Christ. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. As we can see, Allah identifies him with the heir of the earth, and Christ identifies himself with the heir of the earth. Could Jesus have been a faithful Muslim and claims position that Allah alone holds? Surah 22.6 speaks of Allah. This is so because God is the reality. It is he who gives life to the dead. Jesus Christ says in John 11.25 that I am the resurrection and the life. Surah 24.35 says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Jesus Christ says in John 8.12, saying, I am the light of the world. Surah 89.21-23 says, Nay, when the earth is pounded by power, that the Lord cometh, and his angels rank upon rank and hell, that that day it is brought face to face. Jesus Christ claims to be divine judge in Matthew 25.31, which states, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So according to the Quran, Jesus makes claims that can only be considered divine claims. All of Mr. Zatari's points result from misunderstandings of Christian doctrine. All of them have been refuted. He didn't refute any of my points. All of mine stand, all of his fall, and all these additional points that I have made from the Quran stand as well. Thank you very much. Okay, can I be heard now? Is there sound? Okay. So let me begin my 
eight-minute rebuttal. Now, first of all, Cobain or Thomas, the reason why I didn't refute anything is because that was my presentation. In the presentation, you don't refute. This is the time where I start refuting. Now, you brought up the Trinity again, but now I'm using what you're telling everybody in the room. According to you and according to your videos as well, Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not Jesus, and neither are the Holy Spirit. Each are distinct persons, and each are fully God. So, to everybody else, ladies and gentlemen, how many gods do you have? Three persons, none are the other, each is fully God. And I challenged you to bring me a single verse where Jesus says God is one in three or three in one. Notice, he didn't bring that verse. But what does Jesus say in the Gospel of Mark? He says, our Lord God is one. Now what about the other challenges I asked him for? He couldn't bring them. He talks about Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is not God. And now we don't have to go back to Jewish theology as well, because the Jews knew about the Word of God. This was something already in the theology and the wisdom of God. And Jews do not take the wisdom or Word of God as God Himself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how does me asking bring me a single verse where Jesus says, I am God, crystal clear to end the debate, how does that amount to what He brought up? You see, what he does is he brings up a title and then he applies his Trinitarian interpretation to it. As I said before, you know, let's just keep it simple. Keep the Trinitarian interpretation off to the side and just read the text. So on that point, ladies and gentlemen, we are settled. There is not a single verse in the entire four Gospels where Jesus ever said, I am Yahweh. There is not a single verse in the entire four Gospels where Jesus ever said, I am fully God and I am fully man. Now you claim he called himself the great I am, a title of God. Well, my friend, many people in the Bible are given titles of God. This is not something unique. In the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, you have a king who is called Kings of King. Another title of God throughout the Bible is the title Lord. Many people throughout the Bible are called Lord. So being given a similar title does not make you the God. Rather, just make it much easier, come out and bring the explicit verse where there is no debate, where he clearly says, I am and Yahweh debate over. So that's what you have to do if you want to establish your case. And then you brought up Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. This is, this is very interesting. First of all, Thomas, and to every other Trinitarian, you need to learn that the context determines the passage, not the passage determines the context. Throughout the four Gospels, Throughout the four Gospels, from Mark to Matthew to Luke to John, every time we see a believer in Jesus, every time we look at a person who followed and believed in Jesus, every time these people used to call him either a prophet, the Messiah, the Son of Man, or sometimes the Son of God. None of these titles are divine titles. In fact, that's something you said in your presentation, and I challenge you, bring a single verse where it says the title Son of Man equals divine. None of these terms meant that Jesus was God. So now we have this single verse, ladies and gentlemen, this verse from Thomas, all on its own. It's the only verse which supposedly calls Jesus God. Now what someone honest will do, he will let the Jesus God. Now what someone honest will do, he will let the context determine it, 
not this single verse on its own to determine an entire theology. Now you have to ask yourselves, why in the world would Thomas even believe that Jesus was God? Remember, he was doubting Thomas because he doubted Jesus rose from the dead. That was his doubt. And then he sees Jesus alive, so he was shocked. Now, in that situation, what would make him believe that Jesus is God? That's something you have to answer. There is nothing in that situation with, which would make Thomas believe Jesus to be God. Now again, these titles, Theos and Kurios, the titles that Thomas called Jesus, these titles do not necessarily refer to God in the absolute sense. After all, Moses was called Theos, Satan is called a God, so these terms do not mean that Jesus is the God. Now, what do we know about these titles, and what do we know about Jesus? We know for a fact that these titles could be used of men of high ranking, such as prophets, the Messiah, so obviously, if Thomas was referring to Jesus as Theos and Kurios, we know from the context of the entire four Gospels that he was obviously referring to Jesus in the sense of higher ranking. Abraham is even called Lord. So my friend, you need to bring the context to support your interpretation of this passage, which you can do. You want to isolate this verse from doubting Thomas and then define everything under this when it's actually the other way round. What else? What else did he bring up? Daniel 7, that's the point you brought up, but that refers to the Son of Man. But I'll address it now. Isn't it interesting, ladies and gentlemen? He refers to Daniel 7, the Son of Man. Everybody, go read Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, do you know what it says? It says that the Son of Man was given power. Given. And I'm off the mic. All right, thank you, Mrs. Atari. Now I'm going to refute every statement that he made. First of all, in Daniel 7, he tries to argue that Jesus, that Jesus was Sammy, he have one minute left. Sammy, he have. Hey, Sultan, what are you doing? Um, it, his time was up. Kavane is next. So, Kavane, uh, your mic. No, don't redot me, please. Don't redot me. Let me finish. Don't redot me, okay? Ta, uh, Kavi, he take. Listen, let me finish. Yes, t Sammy, he have one minute left, okay? The guy he uh, compare he take uh, one minute extra, right? Yes. No, I told him to subtract one minute, and he did subtract one minute, so his time was up. Stop reducting me. Stop reducting me. Let me finish after take the mic. Sheesh. He redot me. You, what you are you doing? No. Stop redot me. Sheesh. Okay, so I'm on the mic. I have, yeah, I had a minute left. I didn't know what was going on the text. He took eight minutes, but that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Either way, back to Daniel 7, since I had a minute left. According to Daniel 7, the supposed son of man, in Daniel 7, he is given the kingdom. He doesn't own it. Rather, God gives it to him. So there's something else for everybody to think about. Not only does Jesus pray to God, not only does Jesus have a God, God also gives him 
the kingdom that Cabain is talking about, the divine title of son of man. But now I'm going to challenge you, Cabain, to bring verses that show that the title son of man equals divine, that the title Messiah equals divine, and the title son of God equals divine, equals God. Those are the challenges. And again, I challenge you, bring me the explicit verse. I'm off the mic. Thank you, Mr. Zatari. Now let's deal with this. Okay, first of all, as for Daniel chapter 7, you said that because Jesus Christ is given a kingdom, that this implies that he did not already have it, and that therefore he cannot be God. But what did the Quran say about Allah himself? Allah says, it is we who will inherit the earth. Does that not imply that Allah does not already own the earth? By your own logic, Allah's deity would be denied. So therefore, your logic cannot be true, because for if your logic was true, then both Christianity and Islam is false. Okay, now let's deal with some of your other points, but let me first point out what you did not refute. You did not refute any of my demonstrations from the Quran that Jesus was God. You did not, you did not refute any of my demonstrations that Jesus claimed divine titles given to God alone in the Quran, especially Al-Haq, the truth. You did not refute the claim or the argument that in the Quran, the truth is a title given only to Allah, and the Bible gives it to Jesus Christ. So therefore, according to the Quran, Jesus Christ must be God. Now, you said... Uh, according to me, Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not Jesus, and neither is the Holy Spirit, and each is distinct, and each is fully God. But you have to understand what I mean by fully God. I do not mean that uh, they are each distinct in being. I mean that each fully possesses the attributes of deity. Now, you ask me for one verse saying that these three uh, persons are one. I can't give you an explicit verse, but you have to look at the message of the whole of Scripture. You yourself said in your commentary on Doubting Thomas that we cannot just look at one verse, we must look at the entire entire context of the biblical gospels that is what i am doing you're being a hypocrite here because you don't like one verse but now you're demanding one verse let's look at the whole of the biblical gospels see what it teaches it teaches one god who exists in three persons father son and holy spirit you say that the Jews do not believe that the wisdom of God is God. I ask that nobody please I am me during this. You said that the Jews do not believe that the wisdom of God is God. However, a study of pre-Christian Judaism indicates that Judaism was not Unitarian. Rather, they did believe in multiple persons in one God, including, incidentally, the Word of God. You can see this in the Aramaic Targums, where frequently there are two Yahwehs, and they replace one of these Yahwehs with the Word. Therefore, it is only post-Christian Judaism which rejected the idea of the wisdom of God as a separate eternal person in reaction to Christianity, and pre-Christian Judaism actually was Trinitarian. Now, I have shown that in the Old Testament the wisdom of God is called eternal, and that the word of God is called Yahweh God himself by Abraham. You did not refuse these passages. You say in response to my statements about the great I Am that many people are called titles of God. However, you misunderstand why they are called these titles of God. They are called titles of God in the sense that they say, the Lord is mighty, or the Lord is great, but they do not actually call these people the Lord. And do you see anyone in the Old Testament named Yahweh? Do you see anyone in the Old Testament saying, you are the great I Am? It is Jesus Jesus Christ, who takes the statements made by Yahweh of, uh, in the Old Testament and applies them to himself. For example, when he's walking on the water, what do they say? Uh, he says, you see me, Jesus Christ, don't be afraid for I am. Jesus is, you don't be afraid because you see me, just as Yahweh says, because you see me, don't be afraid. Now, as for doubting Thomas, you say that context determines the passage and that theos does not necessarily mean God. Now, I find this ironic, considering that earlier you said, you asked for a passage where Jesus says, I am God, and the Greek for that would be Theos. If I provided that, what would you say? You would simply say, Theos does not always mean God. But look at what Thomas says. He says, my Lord and my God. He says, my Lord and my God. This is a title only used of deity. Only used of deity. So therefore, you are simply wrong in your contextual analysis of this. You say, why would Thomas believe Jesus is God? He would believe Jesus is God for the very reasons that I have provided. Uh, the reason that Jesus claims to be the eternal wisdom of Yahweh, that Jesus claims to be the eternal word of Yahweh, that Jesus claims to be all these things which are given only to Yahweh, and that's why Jesus is God, and that's why Thomas believes Jesus is God, because that's all Jesus has said, and that's what Thomas has heard. Now, you challenge me to show where Son of Man means God. I show you from Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man is worshipped. Who deserves is worshipped? Who deserves worship? God alone is to be worshipped, and the Son of Man receives the worship due to God alone is worshipped. Who deserves worship? God alone is to be worshipped, and the Son of Man receives the worship due to God alone. If that doesn't mean deity, what does mean deity? 
Furthermore, I have shown how the Son of Man uh, goes with his angels, and that the that this is spoken of as an event in the Quran, which happens for Allah alone. If Son of Man claims things that are done for Allah alone, then that means Son of Man must be Allah incarnate, God incarnate. So therefore, you are wrong on that because Son of Man is a divine title. You ask me to show you where Mashiach, Messiah, is a divine title. And I can show you biblical prophecy where the Messiah is spoken of being God, but I can't show you in the New Testament where Messiah, or where it says the word Mashiach, uh, Christos, means God, because it doesn't. But in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, uh, the Messiah is spoken of as el Gibon, mighty God. This is used three places in the, in the Old Testament, and in all three places it refers to Yahweh alone. So the Messiah is spoken of as el Gibon uh, due to Yahweh alone. So therefore, because of all these things, you, ref you refuse to refute any of my points, al-haq or anything like that. Uh, none of my points from the Quran you've refuted. You've ignored much of my arguments. I have addressed every single one of your arguments and refuted them. Therefore, all mine stand, all zeros fall. I am winning this debate. Thank you. Oh, uh, okay. Am I on the mic? Can I be heard one second? Okay, thank you, Cabane. This is, debate is recorded, and he just debunked his entire theology. <clears throat> he just did a mistake that one of his friends did a few years ago, Nabil Qureshi, and I chased him on this point in the entire debate. According to Cabane, he said that the reason why Jesus is God, or in Daniel 7, he's worshipped. You know, he's worshipped. Now, what better proof do you need? He said something like that, and you can go back. Well, my friend, Kebain, if you read the Old Testament properly, in Daniel chapter 2, verses 46 to 49, the prophet Daniel was worshipped as well by a pagan king. And guess what? Daniel didn't rebuke him. Neither did God. Indeed, what better proof do you need? Daniel was worshipped. Therefore, by your criteria, Daniel is also God. You no longer believe in three gods. Add Daniel to the pile. So thank you. You just proved you believe in four gods. Now, the point of the Trinity, which I've keep, I keep repeating, remains. Ladies and gentlemen, he can keep turning and saying what he wants, but according to his Trinitarian belief, the, God, uh, the Father is not Jesus, Jesus is not the Father, neither are the Holy Spirit. Each is three separate distinct persons, each is fully God. How many gods do you have? That's three. And he still can't meet the challenge. Show me a single verse where Jesus said God is three in one, or one in three. What did Jesus say? He said, God is one. He has yet to bring an explicit verse. He keeps talking about the Word of God, the wisdom of God. Yet the wisdom of God, the Word of God, is not a separate, distinct entity that is fully God. The Jews did not believe that. And you went to Proverbs, Proverbs 8, which talks about the wisdom of God. There are Trinitarians who even deny that Proverbs 8 is talking about some separate, distinct entity known as Jesus. Now, what about Jesus said, I am? He walked on water and said, I am. This is, this is why Trinitarians always ignore context. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one day Jesus, you know, remember, they went on the ship and they saw him walking on water. The disciples saw Jesus walking on water and they thought he was a spirit. They thought he was some evil spirit, so they got afraid. So what did Jesus say? What did he say? He said, it's me, I am, ego eimi. What does that word simply mean in the Greek? It simply means I am, it's me. So all he said was, it's me, I am. Calm down. They thought he was some evil spirit, so Jesus says, it's me. So let's say you're in the house, and your wife or your younger brother gets afraid of you in the night because he thought you were some thief and you say hey calm down it's me that's the context ladies and gentlemen of the verse he just brought up so please uh, Thomas don't don't make silly interpretations like that that's that's a joke and then you bring up the Messiah in the Old Testament indeed what about the the Messiah in the Old Testament let's go to Isaiah chapter 7 this is beautiful ladies and gentlemen in Isaiah chapter 7, there's a prophecy about the Messiah. 
Do you know what Isaiah chapter 7 verses 13 to 16? Isaiah 7, 13 to 16. Do you know what this verse says about the Messiah? This verse says that the Messiah will be ignorant and that he will learn about right and wrong. As it says, he will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. According to Isaiah 7, the Messiah is going to be a small boy who won't know good from bad. This is their God who doesn't know good from bad. Are you kidding me? Your God has to learn about good and bad. And it's right in that verse from the Old Testament. I mean, talk about a slam dunk. That's their God, ladies and gentlemen. And that's another verse for you, Thomas, showing your God is ignorant. And by the way, the other one which you asked for, I believe, is in Mark 11. I'm not sure about Jesus being not all knowing about the last hour. I still have to check on it. Now, what about Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6? Isaiah 9, verse 6, he brought that up where Jesus is called El Gibur, the mighty God. So that proves uh, Jesus is God. One second, let me get the verse. First of all, the verse is called El Gibur in the Hebrew. So. Okay, just to quickly say something. Uh the next uh, section will be 20 minutes crossfire, two minutes each uh, debater. So, Hulkster, if you want to keep time, um, each debater has two minutes each, and it will go for 20 minutes. So, just to let you guys know. And, Kabane, you start first. Your mic. All right, I'm going to... All right, I'm going to try to quickly get through what Sammy just said in two minutes. Okay, so Sammy just said I just refuted my entire case because Daniel is worshipped in Daniel 2 by pagans. What is the key fact here? These are pagans worshipping Daniel. What does Daniel chapter 7 say? Daniel chapter 7 says all nations will worship the Son of Man. What does all nations include? Monotheistic Israel, not pagans, Israel itself. So this is all nations, and God is encouraging the worship of the Son of Man. In Daniel 2, God neither encourages it nor rejects it, but in Daniel 7, God encourages it and encourages worship to the Son of Man. Mr. Zatari says, again, I can't show a single verse. But Mr. Zatari earlier said that we must look at the entire context of the New Testament. He's going back and forth here depending on what's convenient for him. He's simply being hypocritical here. He loses this point by contradicting himself. He says, again, Jews did not believe that wisdom was a separate person. I already answered this in my last speech. Jews did believe that wisdom was a separate person according to the pre-Christian Aramaic Targums of the Old Testament. And so Jews did believe that, and in response to Christianity, Jews changed their beliefs to reflect uh, their anti-Christian doctrines. Now next, he said, when the disciples were on the water, he said, all, the, all Jesus was saying, well, it's me. Well, yes, that was part of the point for it, but is it just a coincidence that he appropriated the exact Greek words from the Septuagint that Yahweh, God, uses of himself? Yahweh said, when you're on the water, don't be afraid, for I am. And Jesus is on the water, the disciples are afraid, and Jesus says, don't be afraid, I am. The exact same words that Yahweh God uses. He quotes Isaiah 7. Now, this is why we need to understand the Hebrew Bible. Isaiah 7 has two references. One is the Messiah. One is a minor anointed one who appears in Isaiah 8. This reference appears in Isaiah 8. The things about them not knowing right and wrong has to do with the reference in Isaiah 8. It does not have to do with the Messianic reference. This is supported by biblical scholar Craig Blomberg. The virgin birth, that has to do with the Messianic reference. Biblical prophecy is complex. There are two references in Isaiah 8. The reference in Isaiah 8 who is spoken of as eating curds and honey and not knowing... Okay. Yeah. Time's over. You're on point, though. Okay, can I be heard? Can I be heard? Is it a one... Can I be heard? Just give me a one. And then, okay. Now, funny. Can I be heard? Just give me a one. And then, okay. 
Now, funny point, Kevin. So your rebuttal to Daniel is that Jesus is worshipped by all nations. Daniel is just worshipped by these guys. Ladies and gentlemen, in Daniel, when Daniel was worshipped, Daniel was a prophet of a monotheistic God, ladies and gentlemen. This wasn't some hillbilly. He was preaching monotheism. He was a Jewish prophet. He didn't reject their worship, and God himself didn't condemn it. Ladies and gentlemen, if a pagan, if some wrong people started worshiping a prophet, and the prophet doesn't say anything about it, and God himself, Yahweh, who condemns polytheism, says you, sometimes you should be killed for it, and he doesn't condemn it, what more do you need? As you said, Cobain, what stronger evidence do you need for him being a deity? He was worshipped, and he didn't reject him. What about Isaiah 7? No, you're wrong. Everybody, go read Isaiah 7. The context is clear. This is a prophecy about the one who will be born to the virgin. It comes right after it. What about the Jews? The Jews changed their belief after Christianity. That is false. They didn't change their belief. Rather, what happened is that Christians came along and changed the Old Testament belief to fit your belief. And we can find that throughout the New Testament. Why, why were people confused about a man-god? Why were people confused about a god-man? Why were they so ignorant about this, like they never heard about it? Because it never was taught in the Old Testament. The Jews didn't change their belief at all. The Jews don't believe the wisdom of God is some trinity, and that's a fact. So that's your wisdom of God, and my time is going to be up in like 10 seconds, so I'm off. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Zatari. Now, again, you you say, oh, well, God was silent about the worship of Daniel and Daniel 2. There is a difference between silence and encouraging the worship. If God had encouraged the worship of the prophet Daniel, we would have had a problem. I see in Daniel chapter 7, God calls all nations before the throne of the Son of Man and says, worship him. And note that the Son of Man is seated on the right hand of Yahweh. Remember earlier I pointed out that that means that the Son of Man shares in Yahweh's divine authority. You did not refute that point, you automatically lose that point. As for Isaiah chapter 7, I say again, oh, look at the context. It's referring to the virgin, one born of the virgin. I agree, but biblical prophecy is complex. Scholars recognize that there are two references which often change places in there. Isaiah 7.14, that's referring to the one born of the virgin, but you also see in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 8 that there is one who also fulfills that prophecy because the prophecy is given to people in that time. It has a short-term fulfillment, and that refers to the short-term fulfillment, and it has a long-term fulfillment. You have to understand the complex nature of biblical prophecy. You are simply using your simplistic thinking. Now, as for as for the Jews changing their belief systems, uh, they did change their belief systems. My citation was not from Christian manuscripts of the Old Testament. No, it was from the pre-Christian manuscripts of the Aramaic Targums, which were passed through not Christian hands, but Jewish hands. An example is in uh, Genesis chapter 19, where there are two Yahwehs, where Yahweh rains fire down from Yahweh. The Yahweh on earth rains fire down from the Yahweh in heaven. The Jews in the Aramaic Targum, they call the Yahweh on earth the word of Yahweh. In other words, there are two persons there, and one person is communicating with the other person. This is a Jewish doctrine, this is a Jewish belief. And it is taught clearly in the pre-Christian Jewish Aramaic Targums. You have not even addressed the Aramaic Targums. You didn't address my point about Jesus appropriating the exact Old Testament language used for I am. So when you're walking on the water, don't be afraid. I am. And again, you, you don't address my point about you being hypocritical about showing a single verse. So I win that point. You didn't, you've never addressed my point about Al-Haq and how Jesus claims to be the truth. Whereas in the Quran, only Allah is the truth. So if Jesus is a... Okay. So if Jesus is a Muslim, then he's God. Okay, yeah, it's complex. Isaiah 7 is not complex. You see, this is a typical Trinitarian for you. When you bring them something so clear, which debunks them, they come and say, oh, this is, this is complex. This is complex. Isaiah is complex. No, it isn't. Everybody, go read Isaiah 7 the prophecy about the Messiah. It's not complex at all. Your future Messiah, your God, according to this prophecy, doesn't know right from wrong. And that's a fact. Secondly, Daniel was a prophet of God. Okay? He was a prophet of God. As I said, he wasn't some hillbilly. So, 
why in the world would God stay silent and do nothing? The very same God who condemns polytheism, who condemns prophets, if they go and do something wrong, they will be put to death. Now Daniel is worshipped, and God doesn't do He goes missing all of a sudden. Where, where are you, God? Well, what's up? This guy's being worshipped. I thought polytheism was wrong. Silence. Nothing on that case. Now you bring up the, the Jewish Targums, etc., etc. Again, this is a Jewish topic. Jews do not believe the wisdom of God is God. And I asked you a question. If this belief was in the Old Testament, if Jews believed in a separate or in separate persons within the Godhood, God is made up of three, etc., etc., then why in the world would they be so shocked about a God-man? Why were they so ignorant ignorant about it? Why is it like something new for them? 2,000 years went by, and now you Christians happily come to the scene and we're supposed to believe it? Please, who are you trying to kid? And I'm not being hypocritical at all. You still need to bring the verse. You still need to bring the verse. The verse in Thomas, doubting Thomas, is completely different to a verse where he says, I am Yahweh. My time is up. Okay, so let's go back to this Daniel issue real quick, because you just ignored my last point. There is a difference between uh, ex being silent about false worship and encouraging false worship. You can see in Daniel chapter 7, God the Father, Yahweh, is encouraging the worship of the Son of Man. Does God the Father encourage the worship of one who is not to be worshipped? No, he never would. Would he be silent on it? Apparently he is, but he would never encourage it. Okay, now, as for Isaiah 7, you just com you just make fun of me. You say, oh, it's complex. You know how I know it's complex? Because I have read secular, uh, non-Christian, and Christian biblical scholarship who both say that there are two references in Isaiah chapter 7. I have had atheists come to me and say, oh, look, in Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah 7 is fulfilled. But it, look at Isaiah 7, two reference within one context. Okay, again, you ignore my point about Jesus being the truth. The Quran says that there is only that there is one person who is to be called the truth. That is God alone, Allah alone. Jesus claims to be the truth. You ignore it again and again. You continue to ignore it. You have ignored all of my objections about the Quran, proving that Jesus is God, how Jesus claims titles given to God in the Quran. You've ignored my objection about Jesus appropriating the exact Greek, Greek words for... Um, a uh, Greek language for God using the prophet Isaiah. You just ignore, 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 and ignore. And you say, okay, well, why are the Jews surprised that, uh, why don't the Jews understand? Because though they believed in multiple persons in one God, they did not believe that the Messiah was to become, uh, was to become, uh, was one of these persons. That's why they're confused. And you say, oh, well, well, don't Jews believe there's one person in one God? Modern Jews do. Look at the Aramaic Targums. Look at the Aramaic Targums. There is clearly a multi-personal belief in the Aramaic Targums. You have not addressed this point. I'm saying, I'm not being hypocritical at all. You haven't shown the single verse, but that you said we can't just look at a single verse. What is it? Do I have to show you a single verse, or are we not allowed to just look at a single verse? You have to answer that question. You're just being you're just being hypocritical, Ken. You have not addressed the vast majority of my points here. Look, uh, look at the Old Testament. Look at the scholar I quoted who said that wisdom claims titles that are claimed by God alone. It is clear wisdom is God. Thank you. Okay, there is, a, there is a big difference. When someone just comes up and says, I am Yahweh, there is no debate. It's over. And everybody knows that. It's, com it's a completely different situation. And you're trying to run away with it now. You're trying to run away from it and bring up this hypocritical point because you can't even bring the verse. So bring the verse. Because then when you bring that verse, the context everything you're saying could revolve around that. That lays the foundation. But he never even said it. You don't even have that context to back you up. And when you compare Doubting Thomas, who gives him titles, which are given to other men, which aren't even explicit, then you have no case. And again, okay, God is silent. God is silent on Daniel being worshipped. So if he doesn't say anything against it, I guess there was nothing wrong with it. Hey, God is silent. God is silent on Daniel being worshipped. 
So if he doesn't say anything against it, I guess there was nothing wrong with it. Thank you. So worshiping Daniel, nothing wrong with that, ladies and gentlemen. The Christian God is silent on polytheism. No wonder you're a Trinitarian. Now it all makes sense. Now, you even agree with me. You can't even give a proper response to why the Jews during the lifetime of Jesus and after him were surprised about a belief in a God-man. Oh, it's complex. It's not complex at all, my friend. You are doing what you accuse the Jews of doing. You are the one who is coming up and changing their belief. And this other point, Jesus will sit at the right hand of God. Indeed, Jesus will sit at the right hand of God because he doesn't actually sit on the throne of God. Sitting on the right hand of God is in honor. On top of that, his disciples will also judge people with him. Funny how you left that point out. His disciples, ladies and gentlemen, will judge with him. And anyway, when I come back on the mic, we're going to talk about Mary. What did Mary believe about her son? This goes back to my first point, what the Jews believe. I'm off the mic. It's starting to get ridiculous that Mr. Zatari refuses to address my point about Jesus being the truth. I've said it enough times that I know that Mr. Zatari has heard it, and I know that he's simply refusing to address it. The Quran says Allah alone is to be given the title of the truth. Jesus claims the title of the truth, therefore, according to the Quran, Jesus must have claimed deity. Now, as for sitting at the right hand of God, I have made the point that in the ancient Jewish testament of Job, sitting at the right hand of God meant that you shared in God's divine authority. The prophets sit at God's left hand, or they stand at his right hand. The disciples are with Jesus, but they do not sit at the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ, by sitting at the right hand of the Father, claims to share in divine authority. My source, my source for that is the Testament of Job. Again, you claim that, oh, well, why were they confused about the God-man? Well, they were confused about the God-man because they didn't believe that one of the persons of the Jewish Trinity would become incarnate in the God-man. They did believe in a multi-personal God, but that is not the same thing as believing in a God-man. You're simply trying to mesh these two issues together. It's not going to work. Again, respond to my assertion about the truth, and Jesus claimed to be the truth. Now, as for the prophet Daniel, you again ignore my point. There's a difference between being silent on pagan worship. God is still silent on pagan worship. Why doesn't God come down here and say, uh, why didn't God come down to the Christians and say, stop worshipping a man? He's being, your, your God, Allah, is being silent on pagan worship. So God's silence proves nothing, but God is not just silent in Daniel chapter 7, he encourages the worship of the Son of Man. So if the Son of Man is not to be worshipped, why in the world is Yahweh God encouraging the worship of the Son of Man? Now you say, oh, divine wisdom isn't God, but Abraham, you claim to be faithful to Abraham. Abraham, Genesis chapter 15, verse 2, says to the word, O Yahweh God. And as I've noted, the word Lagos is equivalent to the wisdom of God. So Abraham calls the Lagos Yahweh, calls the wisdom Yahweh. Jesus claims the wisdom, therefore Jesus claims to be Yahweh. It's as simple as that. You say, where does Jesus say, I am Theos, so I am God? But earlier you claimed that Theos doesn't necessarily mean God. Which is it, Mr. Zatari? Indeed, when somebody is calling Jesus a simple theos, that doesn't make him God. But when someone, what did I say? I said explicitly when someone says, I am God. That's what I'm asking for. And you keep bringing this point up about the truth. It's not that I'm ignoring it. I keep forgetting it because it's such a rubbish point. Yeah, Jesus is the truth. But now, can you bring me the verse you keep talking about? Because there is a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad said, Paradise is the truth. Hell is is the truth. All of these things are real. Furthermore, let's assume that a Quranic concept disagrees with a biblical concept. The fact is, in the biblical context, that wouldn't make him God. So your entire point is irrelevant. It's nonsense. It's garbage. So that's what that. And you keep ignoring what I'm saying about Daniel. This is like the third, fourth time I have to repeat it. And I'll say it again. Daniel is not some hillbilly. He's not some hillbilly. He's not some normal guy on the street. He's not some normal guy like me and you. He is a prophet who is communicating with God. God is communicating with him, giving him prophecies. This guy is a representative of God. And he is being worshipped. He has his own book, the book of Daniel. 
and he's being worshipped in a divine book, and God is silent on it. You keep ignoring this context that I keep bringing up, because you know it shoots you in the foot. Your God went silent when his prophet, a Jewish prophet of the first commandment, who he sent, he went silent when polytheism happened. Your God went missing. He didn't say anything against it when a prophet is worshipped, so there's nothing wrong with it. And now you say, oh, well, the Jews, they were just confused. The Jews didn't believe in a God-man. Oh, how convenient that you just came along. If it's so clear, why didn't they? Notice the inconsistency. My time is up. Okay, you said, if it's so clear, why didn't they believe it? Okay, I can just use that same logic against you. If it's so clear in the Bible that Jesus isn't God, why don't we believe Jesus isn't God? Bad logic, bad point. Now you say, Daniel is not some hillbilly, he's a prophet of God. I acknowledge that, but again, you ignore my point. There's a difference between silence to false worship and encouraging false worship. Now, let's say that Daniel said, yeah, come on, keep worshiping me. Let's say Yahweh said, yeah, keep worshiping Daniel. Then you would have a point, but he doesn't. They're just silent on it. And Daniel 7, Yahweh and encourages the worship of the Son of Man. You continue to ignore this point. You say, I'll hawk the truth in the biblical context that wouldn't make him God. Why? You just asserted that. You didn't prove it. Now you ask for the Quranic verse, and I'm going to give it to you. In Surah 2262, it says, that is because Allah is the truth. al haq And that is... That which they call upon other than him is falsehood, and because Allah is the most high and the grand. Now, in Arabic translations of the New Testament, what does Jesus call himself? Al-Haq. Al-Haq. And you claim Jesus is a faithful Muslim? If he's a faithful Muslim, then he's claiming to be God, and therefore isn't a faithful Muslim, and therefore you have to lose the debate in the first place. Why doesn't the biblical, why does the biblical context mean something different? It's a clear title. Al-Haq, the truth. Uh, now for as Isaiah, you've never, you haven't responded to Isaiah 7, you've dropped that point, you dropped the point about Jesus saying, I am and you responded to it a while ago, I responded to you, you dropped it, he appropriates the exact language in the Old Testament. Furthermore, I gave other examples of Jesus saying, I am appropriating language in the prophet Isaiah, that you haven't addressed at all. You just focus on this one case, you don't address any of the other cases. Uh, you have dropped your point uh, that Jews did not believe that wisdom was a separate person. I have shown clearly that Abraham calls the wisdom of God in the Old Testament, Yahweh, Abraham, our father Abraham, the prophet, claims that... Um, claims that wisdom was Yahweh God. Jesus claims to be the wisdom of God. Therefore, it's simple. Jesus claims to be Yahweh God. You say, well, Jesus would have to say, I am Yahweh. No Jew or Christian in, the, in that time period used the word Yahweh because Yahweh was considered too holy to be said. So Jesus wouldn't use the word Yahweh. He would use Theos, and that's exactly what Thomas calls Jesus, Theos. Okay, uh, you say I dropped Isaiah. I didn't drop Isaiah 7. Please don't make things up. You couldn't even respond to Isaiah 7. You gave, a, you gave a rubbish answer about some seculars and them saying this and that. Everybody, go read Isaiah 7 for yourself. And your response to the Jews not believing in Jesus as a God or not believing in a God man is saying, I'm using bad logic. Not really, because we're having debate. They didn't even have a debate on this issue. There was no such belief on this issue. That shows how crystal clear it was. Furthermore, it is clear in the Bible that Jesus is not God. I brought you a reference in my presentation where they used to debate each other. Who is Jesus, God or man? So actually, it was very clear for the early followers of Jesus. And you never went back to that reference. Indeed, it is very clear. As I told everybody, if you leave their Trinitarian interpretations aside, they have nothing. He's yet to bring a single verse where Jesus says, God is one in three, or one in three. He's yet to bring a single verse where Jesus says, I am Yahweh. And he's yet to bring a single verse where Jesus says, I am the God-man. And then you bring up the point about I am. That means nothing. That was already addressed when he was on the sea. And when he said before Abraham, I am, again, that doesn't prove anything. Just because he's given that similar title, there are other people in the gospel who use that exact term, I am. Other people throughout the Bible are given titles of God. So that is a, another mute point. And again, you went back to Al-Haq, and I brought you, I told you, there's a hadith, the Prophet Muhammad talked about hell being the truth, heaven being the truth. Indeed, Jesus is the truth. There's nothing wrong with that. He talked about hell being the truth, heaven 
being the truth. Indeed, Jesus is the truth. There is nothing wrong with that. And all Muslims believe that. So, and I even said, even if the Quran contextually disagrees, my time is up. First, let's, let's go on this point on al-Haq. There is a difference bec between saying that it is true that a place exists or saying that this is the truth. There is a difference between calling that the truth and calling a person the truth. Uh, oh, wait, is, was it not my... <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to let you guys know that the crossfire section is over, and next we will be having the three-minute closing statements, and Cabane, uh, you're next for your closing statements. Are you ready? And I'll just pass you the mic, so, uh, okay. Oh, I thought I was going last because I went first in the actual opening, but whatever, I'll go first. Um, well, actually, I'd actually rather you go uh, go first, so go ahead. Okay, and by the way, to everybody else, there's still going to be a Q&A after the debate. So now, in tonight's debate, I've issued basically three challenges. I started with two, and then I went into a third. And none of these challenges have been met. Not a single explicit verse has been brought. He keeps talking about the wisdom of God, the Word of God. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God is His uh, wisdom, his power, and his purpose, etc., etc. That's what the Jews believed about the Word of God and the wisdom of God. Go ask any Jew today, and they can even bring you their own Jewish books. No Jew believes that the Word of God or the wisdom of God equals another God, a distinct God that is Jesus. And he even agreed with me. He said, it, yeah, the Jews didn't believe the, the word would be incarnated as the God-man. So none of those challenges were met. Now what about another point? About Jesus being worshipped supposedly in Daniel 7. Now ladies and gentlemen, in Daniel 7, as I showed you, Jesus was given the kingdom. He doesn't own it. He was given the kingdom. And I'm going to post a link that uh, responds to his uh, weak argument that Allah inherits the kingdom. I'll post that when I'm in the Q&A. And then even if Jesus was worshipped as he claims, the prophet, the prophet, not some hillbilly on the side of the street, the prophet Daniel, who has his own divine inspired Bible book in the Bible right now, if you go open any Bible, the prophet Daniel, under God, was worshipped by a king. Daniel, a monotheistic Jew who believes in the Ten Commandments, didn't reject that worship. God, who is communicating with Daniel, Cabane, Thomas, my opponent, gave you a prophecy from Daniel. And this same Daniel is worshipped by a king. Daniel doesn't rebuke him. God doesn't rebuke him. What more do you need? Daniel must be your fourth God. And then we go back to Isaiah chapter 7. He has no response to that. All he has is, oh, a few scholars say this and that. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said at the start of this debate, read the text for yourself. It literally says that this child will not know right from wrong. He's not going to know good and bad. And it says that Right after, it says that the child will be given birth to this lady, etc., etc. It's the same prophecy. So to summarize, Jesus was ignorant. He has a God. He prays to God. He never said, I am God. He never said, Trinity. God is three in one. He said, God is one. Um, he ate. And all of these things, all of these things. So now you need to logically ask yourself, is he God? No, he isn't. I'm off the mic. All right, thank you, Mr. Zatari. So I want to go over the debate, and I want to summarize why I won this debate and why Jesus Christ clearly is God from the New Testament. First of all, let's go to Isaiah 7. He has never actually refuted these scholars. He's just made fun of them. He's got some scholars. Ooh, big whoop. But he, has he refuted them? No, he hasn't. He's just dropped 
dropped them, and he's tried to mask the fact that he's dropped them by just mocking them. Mockery is not a valid argument. Okay, he says that, oh, hell and heaven are called the truth in the, or in the Hadith, but calling places truthful, as in they truly exist, and calling a person the truth, al haq is different things. This is demonstrated by the fact that in 922 AD, Muslims tried to kill a Sufi who claimed to be al haq the truth, because they say that he was blaspheming. So Jesus says the same thing as the Sufi. Uh, the Muslims say that this Sufi uh, was blaspheming. Why don't they say that Jesus was claiming the same thing as a Sufi? Because he clearly was. He says, well, Jesus was given the kingdom, so that doesn't mean he, that means he already uh, has it. Um, or that, that means he didn't already have it. He says he's going to post a rebuttal to my argument about Allah. Uh, I'll wait for that to come up. But let me just point out that according to the Quran, Allah is the heir to the kingdom. And furthermore, Richard Balcom, a noted biblical scholar, notes in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, that uh, Jesus' exaltation is an exaltation of an eternal nature. The Greek indicates that it is an eternal exaltation. Uh, that's the New Testament. And the Aramaic indicates it's an eternal exaltation, uh, not a temporal ex exaltation. He mentions Daniel being worshipped. And he says, oh, well, he does, they don't object. There's a difference between not objecting to worship being given, and there's a difference between that and actually encouraging the worship. If God encouraged the worship of the prophet Daniel, you would have a point, but he doesn't. In, in the prophet Daniel chapter 7, God encourages the worship of the Son of Man. Would God encourage the worship of a pagan God? No. Uh, you say, oh, Jesus, the I am, does, that doesn't mean anything. I address this poor. And I addressed your response to this, and you never responded. Jesus uses the exact Greek words given in the Greek Septuagint that Yahweh uses. Uh, Jesus appropriates the exact words several times. You focus on one example. I've given several examples that you haven't responded to. You say, oh, just go ask a Jew what they believe about the wisdom of God. I am not referring to modern Jews. Rather, I am referring to the ancient Jews whose beliefs are elaborated in the Aramaic Targums. You've never refuted the evidence given in the Amer Aramaic Targums that the ancient Jews were Trinitarians. Now, uh, let me just summarize real quickly. I have shown that the Son of Man is, in is encouraged to be worshipped by God himself. Therefore, the Son of Man may be considered God. Jesus claims the title Son of Man. Second, I have shown that Jesus Christ claims the divine title I Am. He is not merely called I Am as like... Oh, God is I am, but he says, I am the great I am. He appropriates the exact language from the Old Testament uh, and applies it to himself. And finally, Jesus called, claims to be the wisdom of God, and in the Old Testament, Abraham calls the wisdom of God Yahweh himself. So therefore, because Jesus is the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of God is Yahweh, Jesus clearly claims to be Yahweh. Uh, thank you very much for listening to the debate, and I will now see the mic to Q&A. Yes, hello everyone here, and salam alaikum to Muslims, and hello and greeting to all non-Muslims. Thank you both of you for respecting uh, both of the debater. Uh, let me uh, respond, if I can ask my question now, let us now, the question about Allah and the Quran. Let me show you, Jesus is not more than a prophet, according to the Quran. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so... All right, okay, I don't ask. All right, uh, let us be fair. We take one Muslim and one Christian. All right, let us be fair. Okay, one Muslim and one Christian. Uh, MK, uh, you can choose one Christian, and me, I choose one Muslim. Is okay? Because I do, cannot know all the people in the text. And only the person you know him, you can undot him. Okay? It's fine with you, MK. And both of the beta. All right. Uh, now I will choose uh, Muslims uh, 25, 15. Muslim. All right. Muslim. Uh, let me un remove that dot. Muslim, do you hear me, brother? Muslim 25. Yes. I read for the question, Akhi. All right. Bro. My 
مايكل زيوس اخي الحبيب مايكل زيوس اخي الحبيب طيب السلام عليكم ورحمه الله الله وبركاته زر از فويس زر از فويس طيب اوكي مايكل زيوس فور كابان Concerning uh, Thomas, when he was surprised and said, "Oh my God, oh my Lord," uh, the writer of this story between Jesus and Thomas, he said, in verse John 20:31, "But these are written that that you might believe what believe to believe in Jesus is God. No, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Christ is not God. The Son of God is not God, and that believing you might have life through His name." So who knows better, Kaban, concerning what was the conversation between uh, Thomas and Jesus? Now, the writer of this story, he didn't believe that Jesus is God. So why you believe using this verse that Jesus is God? My friend. Okay, frankly, that was just an absurd argument. And you said that because John says Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Son of God, that somehow means that John doesn't believe Jesus was God. Are you serious? Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Son of God. He was also God. These are all titles fully applicable to Jesus. And John rightly applied the titles Messiah and Son of God to Jesus Christ. So what is what else does John say? Well, John says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later he says the Word was made flesh into the person of Jesus Christ. So, of course, John believes that Jesus was God. He says it explicitly. The word was God. He also believes that Jesus was the Messiah. He also believes that Jesus was the Son of God, that is, the Son of the Father. He makes all of these three things clear in his gospel. He is simply presenting a fallacy of a false dichotomy by claiming that somehow, because John says Jesus is the Son of God, that that means that Jesus wasn't, didn't fully possess the attributes of deity. That's just an awful argument. It's a terrible fallacy, and it holds absolutely no water. Okay, <clears throat> that argument holds a lot of water, and he basically didn't respond. You brought up a good point. When the author of John ends his gospel, what does he say? He says that you may believe that Jesus is God, or does he say you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, not a divine title? There you go again. And by the way, in the book Confessions of a Trinitarian, or Concessions of a Trinitarian, by Michaelis, a Trinitarian himself concedes that when doubting Thomas said, my Lord and my God, even a Trinitarian scholar admitted that this didn't refer to his divinity, and there are other Trinitarian scholars who conclude with that. With that, I'm off the mic. Uh, okay, it's my question. Um, well, first of all, I want to um, praise both you, both the Christian and the Muslim debater um, for a very um, good debate and both handled each other exceptionally well. Um, so my question is for Sammy. You said that Moses was called Elohim, a God, and that even Satan is referred to as a Theos in the New Testament. Um, I'm just wondering, can you point out anywhere in the Bible where Moses was called my Lord and my God? Or that Satan was called both my Lord and my God? or your Lord and your God, as the as it would imply. And that's my question. Okay, um, I'm not sure of any reference that calls Moses, my Lord and my God, or with Satan. But as I said, we look at all the eyewitnesses throughout the four Gospels. None of them ever believe Jesus is God. They're always calling him the Messiah, the Son of Man the Son of God, all titles which do not denote divinity. Therefore, when he is given those titles, we have to interpret the text with the context. And him being the Messiah, a very high figure, by the way, and a prophet, therefore, when he is called Theos and Kurios, it has to match the context. And again, a Trinitarian scholar, Michaelis, in Concessions of a Trinitarian, even agrees with me. Many people make the same argument that I'm telling you right now. Let the context determine this passage, not let your Trinitarian of the single passage determine the entire context. Now, this verse is completely different to what I'm asking for. 
I am asking for something explicit. Explicit. There is no debate about it where Jesus says, I am the God. I am Yahweh. Nothing to debate about. It's explicit. It's right there. Let's go on. That's what I'm asking for. And what's my time? One second or am I done? 25 minutes, zero seconds. I have one minute, so that would be the response. And again, let the context determine it. And just bring me the verse where Jesus says, I am God. Career. And don't forget, radical moderate. How did that same book, the one you just quoted, how did it end? As the last Muslim speaker said, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Not that so you may believe that Jesus is the God, he's Yahweh. So it can get any clearer than that. And again, there's no reason for Thomas to believe that Jesus was the God in that moment. He was doubting whether Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm off the mic. Okay, so Sammy has said, well, there's no place where Satan or where Moses is called Lord and God. But, okay, but there is a place where Jesus is called Lord and God. The question is, is there a place where Yahweh is called Lord and God? The answer is yes. Psalm thirty-five, twenty-three: Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. So there is a place where Yahweh is called my God and my Lord. There is a place where Jesus is called my God and my Lord. There is no place where Satan or Moses is called my God and my Lord. So as we can see, this is a clear claim to deity. And and yes, while John closes his gospel saying Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, he opens his gospel by saying Jesus is God. The Word was God. So he opens by saying he was God, closes by saying he was the Son of God, the Messiah. John believes all of these things. Hello, assalamu alaikum to Muslims and hello to non-Muslims. Muslims night, are you ready, bro? Muslims night. Muslims night, you hear me? Go, bro. Mic is yours. طيب يا مسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I would like to have a simple question for a Christian debater in generally. It's very simple I think. If we I was reading the Bible sir and I just by Act 2:22 men of Israel listen to this people of the room listen to this as well. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you, as you yourselves know. Uh, the question is, what should, uh, what should I do with such verse, sir? Uh, it's not talking about God. Obviously, it's not talking about God. It's talking simply about Jesus of Nazareth, who was accredited by the God to do some miracles, exactly like the other prophets, the several prophets in the Bible. Uh, if you don't like this verse, maybe we can delete it, if you don't like. Anyway, Sammy, brother, uh, you've done very well. Mike Frey. Well, that was another of these ridiculous questions from the Muslim apologists. Yes, Jesus was a man, and yes, Jesus was accredited by God the Father, because we believe that God the Father and God the Son were separate persons. Jesus was a man, remember, he's the God-man. And so the God the Father accredits God the Son, Jesus Christ, the God-man. There is no contradiction here at all, especially when you take this with the whole of the New Testament, which speaks clearly of Jesus' deity. I have just proven this through a comparison of Psalm 35 and John 20. Thomas says, my God, my Lord and my God to Jesus. The psalmist says, my God and my Lord to Yahweh. It is a clear parallel here between uh, the Old and New Testaments showing that uh, Jesus Christ is Yahweh incarnate. It's clear, the New Testament is very clear about this, and since you're using sources outside the biblical gospels, we can just go to Philippians chapter 2, which calls Jesus in the very nature of God. So the New Testament is clear, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Um, my pal talk, if you can hear me, my pal talk is presently being a little weird. Okay. Okay, it can... Shit. Shoot. Excuse me. Uh, 
Okay, every question he gets is ridiculous or silly, etc., etc. And the brother made a good point. According to Acts, Jesus is a man who God gave miracles. He's a man approved by God. And that's another strong verse that proves that Jesus is not God. It's clear, ladies and gentlemen, how come every verse he brings up has to have fancy interpretations but every verse we bring up is crystal clear. Jesus prayed. Jesus is ignorant. Jesus has a God. Jesus never says I'm God. Jesus is a man accredited by God who gave him miracles. I mean, how much more clearer can he get? And I'm off the mic. Yeah, can I get a one on the mic? Can admins hear me? Yeah, appreciate it. Well, I just posted, what I posted in the room was John 14... Verse 12 to 14. What we, notice, what we notice in that verse, Jesus says he's going back to the Father. And he tells the disciples if they ask for anything in his name, he'll grant their request. What I notice from that specific passage, right, Jesus has to be all-powerful because in order, because he's capable of granting what the disciples ask for. Right? He's omnipotent. And he's omniscient because he's, he, he must know who's asking. He must know who's requesting what, what they're asking for. But the question I have for Sammy is this. All right? It's either, yeah, the question I have is either Jesus is asking the disciples to commit adultery, because we know when, we, when, we, when we're, when we're uh, requesting prayers towards heaven, we must only ask God. Or, if you're comfortable with that verse, I want you to come on the mic and ask Jesus to bless you. I want you to request Jesus to bless you. I want you to uh, ask Jesus to bless your family and Jesus to uh, uh, give you health. Because what I'm saying from that specific passage, right, Jesus is asking disciples and all believers to ask of him while he's in heaven. As a Muslim, are you comfortable with that passage? Your mic. <clears throat> okay, uh, <clears throat> can someone uh, undock Kevin? He's PMing me just for a second. Yeah, can you enable him? <clears throat> undock him? Kevin, put a one if you're in the room and so we know you're undotted. Kevin. Okay, there he is. Just one second, let me clear my throat. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. Now, the question. Uh, you can ask Jesus for something and he will give it to you. Again, context is important. In fact, the context of that verse explains it well. According to the verse that you just mentioned, Jesus is going to the Father. Now, according to Jesus, the Father gives him everything. That's in John chapter 17 and John chapter 13 and Daniel 7. So if Jesus can give something for you, if you ask him for something, that's just an honor and a power bestowed to him by God, as he clearly said. God has given me everything. God has given me these miracles and, and this right. And in that verse, as I just said, he is with the Father. He's with God right there. So, in other words, you can sort of say that he's like a secretary. We know that Jesus does nothing on his own. That's what he himself said in the Gospel of John. I don't do anything of my own. I do the will of the Father. Put this in context with the other verses I just brought up, that God gives him everything. So therefore, logically, you put two and two together. If you ask Jesus for something, you put it with all the verses I just brought up, context, then he's just like a secretary. He asks God, you ask Jesus, he asks God, and there you go. And what, what did even Paul say? There is one mediator between man and God, and that man is Jesus. So, the context, again, you have to look at it with context. And when you look at it context, that's the response I would give you. And I believe that's basically, that's basically it. I'm off the mic. Okay, well, I didn't actually hear the question being asked because I was having problems with the room. 
Uh, but I heard some of the things that were were said by Sammy, so I just want to respond to some of that. Uh, Sammy, you said that Jesus does nothing without the Father, and somehow this disproves his deity. Jesus cannot exist apart from the Father, because Jesus eternally derives his existence from the Father, because he is eternally begotten of the Father. And I actually said this in one of my opening speeches. I said that because Jesus eternally partakes of the essence of the Father, he is deity. Uh, so thus, he cannot exist apart from the Father. Uh, and again, just a response to some things I heard before, nothing. The New Testament clearly teaches Jesus is a man. Uh, when the New Testament says Jesus is a man, that does not preclude his deity at all. In fact, that is precisely what the Christianity teaches. It teaches that Jesus is both man and God, distinct natures united in one person. If I'm ignoring a lot of stuff, it's because I didn't hear a lot of it because I was having problems with the room. Oh. Now is hello everyone. Now our uh, Muslim brother, Herkstar. Are you ready, bro? Herkstar. Yes, bro. Your turn, Akhi uh, Habib. My friend, please uh, uh, undot Christian and you redot Muslims. Okay? Stop undot Christian. Only the who want to take the mic, let undot him. Thank you. Radical moderate, you have been do that. Okay, yes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Can you give me a one, please? Can you guys give me a one? Okay, thank you so much. Um, what I want to ask is, um, I'm not trying to misrepresent the, the Christian's position that Jesus is a fully God and fully man, but if he did had God inside of him, or had a divine nature, then why did he need... A, an angel to strengthen him in Luke chapter 22 verse 30 and 43. Uh, did, didn't Jesus have God inside of him? Why did Jesus depend on someone else, some 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 sort of entity outside the body? Uh, should he be dependent on, on his divine nature? Or can you say that the spirit in, Je in Jesus has uh, no strength whatsoever? Please, I would like you uh, to comment on that. Uh, also, um, you said that he is the wisdom, Jesus is the wisdom. But uh, can you please explain Luke chapter 2 verse 52? Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. If this was God, can you please tell us about it? Your mic. Okay, I'm sorry, Paltok froze up for a second. I did hear most of what you were saying. Did you say it's my mic as in mine? Just give me a yes if you were, so I can respond to that. Okay, you say Jesus is divine wisdom, but Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. How does that work? Okay, well, look, the word wisdom has to be used in specific context to see whether we're referring to simply knowledge or whether we're, we're referring to actual divine wisdom. Uh, divine wisdom, Jesus uses several phrases to indicate that he is to be identified with that divine wisdom. Increasing in wisdom and stature, that is Jesus Christ in his human nature, increasing in his knowledge. As I said, he was limited while he was in his human nature. Um, so, I also wanted to bring up John chapter 14, where uh, Jesus says, if you ask me in my name, I will give it to you. And Jesus is presently in heaven when he asks this, because he says, I am going back to my Father, because he was with the Father before he came into the earth. I was asked to mention that. Um, so, yeah, I'm responding to what I've heard there. So, if I again, if I ignore stuff, it's because Paltalk is starting to be a little screwy with me. And uh, people, please stop IMing me. It's actually kind of irritating. Um, uh, Kevin, you can go on Do Not Disturb. Click on Actions and go on Do Not Disturb. That's what I'm doing. So nobody can uh, PM you at all. So just do that. Okay, and by the way, that was a good question from the brother. Jesus increased in wisdom. So if a person increases in knowledge, that will mean there was a point in time when he wasn't fully aware of good and bad. Hey, isn't that what Isaiah 7 said? It sure is. So indeed, put it together. Even if Christians reject Isaiah 7, is referring to the Messiah, even though most do, even if they re reject Isaiah, they can't reject Luke, which says that Jesus will grow in wisdom, which means he was ignorant at once, which means he once didn't know between right 
and wrong. And this is their God that they want you to want you to worship. So that was another good question, and that's another point that proves Jesus was ignorant on off. No one's talking, so I'm not sure if we're supposed to go to the next question or if I'm supposed to respond to this. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sorry for that. All right, I have a question for the for the Muslim speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, since you tried to debate why um, Jesus is not God, uh, can you can you read for me from from your own book, Surah nine, verse thirty one? And uh, let me see. Why does it say there? that um, well according to my understanding okay, it says when I read it they have taken their rabbis and monks okay, as their lords besides God and the Messiah son of Mary so besides God and the son of Mary you see and you are debating that he is not can you, can you explain that thank you Okay, sure, I can explain that, although that's off-topic. The topic says, according to the four biblical Gospels. But anyway, he's talking about Surah 9, verse 31. They have taken the rabbis. Uh, basically, God is condemning them for paganism, something the biblical God doesn't do, as my opponent said. He just remains silent if his prophet is worshipped. Surah 9, verse 31. They have taken their rabbis and monks beside, as their lords beside God and the Messiah, son of Mary. Um, a Syrian, you know, you need to learn Arabic, because first of all, it's not a complete sentence connected with it right after, when it says, and the Messiah, son of Mary. That's a continuation of condemning them. They have taken the rabbis and monks as the lords beside God, period. And then it goes on to condemn the others, and the Messiah, son of Mary. They also took him as a god. Furthermore, there's also something called context. You, this is so pathetic that you want to use a sentence against the entire context of the Qur'an. The Qur'an, the context, always condemns the worship of Jesus and his mother. So now you want us to believe that this verse supposedly says we should worship him? Who are you trying to kid? You're abusing the Arabic and you're abusing the context. I mean, that's just a joke. There are verses after verses in the Qur'an that says, don't worship Jesus, let's come to an understanding. There's only one God, don't say three, etc., etc. But now he wants to isolate this Arabic grammar, which he doesn't even properly understand, and he wants to make an argument. This is a Trinitarian for you, ladies and gentlemen. They use one entire verse to determine an entire context, even though the context speaks against it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Thanks for demonstrating my point, which I've been trying to make through this entire debate. Context. Well, I don't have any comment on the Quranic verse he cites himself. I do have some comment on what Mr. Zatari said. Mr. Zatari made fun of this uh, questioner for using one verse to destroy the entire context of the Quran. Uh, that is exactly what Mr. Zatari is doing by picking one verse from the end of the Gospel of John to destroy the entire context of the New Testament. The entire context of the New Testament teaches that Jesus is God. One verse saying that Jesus is the Son of God, which he is, does not destroy the entire context. So Mr. Zatari is just being hypocritical by using this whole context argument.
Who's the next? Is the Muslim or Christian, McVeigh? Who's the next, please? Uh, Muslim or Christian? Muslim, all right. Uh, bro Salafi, let me undot him. Pro Salafi. Where is the Pro Salafi? Yes, here. Remove the red dot. Pro Salafi, do you have me? Tape one, please. Yes, all right. I will let Oxalay. I have been asked Oxalay in the text. He don't respond to me. I have been PM him uh, in the text, if you look to the room up. Uh, Salafi, Mike is yours. Oxalate. Uh, uh, Oxalate, please PM me, if you hear me. Okay. Alhamdulillah, salatu salam al rasulullah I got a couple of quick statements and then a question. Uh, the first is, in Daniel 7, it doesn't say worship. It says obey. It says obey. It's the Hebrew word. Uh, it's the Hebrew word of Pelak, which means to obey and serve. So it doesn't say that he worshipped them. And also in uh, in Genesis 18, you said that God appeared to Abraham. God did not appear to Abraham. Angels appeared to Abraham. And the angels went to Sodom. Two of the angels went to Sodom. Let me show you the verse right here. And he called them lords. He called them lords. Also in, uh, in Genesis 33, Esau bows to, uh, Jacob bows to Esau in Genesis 33, 6, and he calls him Lord. Jacob calls Esau Lord. And so Genesis 18, it does not call him God. Genesis the explanations in Genesis 19, you said it said Yahweh to Yahweh. These two Yahwehs are angels. These two these two Yahwehs are angels. In Daniel 7, it doesn't say obey. Now, my question to you is this. This is my question. In Isaiah, uh, the, the, the verse you keep using in Isaiah, Isaiah, it says an Alma will give birth. An Alma will give birth. And the word Alma is not virgin. The word Alma is a girl who just came on her menstrual cycle. It's not a virgin. Uh, the second a girl has a first menstrual cycle, she's a virgin. And we say, and we're to believe that God had begot a son. God begot a son with an alma, right? God has begotten a son with an alma. The word begotten is the Hebrew word yelad, which means procreate. So it's saying that God procreated a son with alma. Okay, here's my question. My question is, in Romans 1.3, it says that Jesus is the sperma of David. Sperma meaning seed. Right? Jesus is the sperma. Okay, you went way over time there, but let me just answer your questions. Okay, first of all, you said the two Yahwehs are angels. That's impossible. Genesis 19, not 18. Just 19 says, Then Yahweh reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Yahweh out of heaven. These are not angels. Angels are never called Yahweh. Angels are sometimes called Elohim. They are never called Yahweh. And I did not refer to Genesis 18 for the Lord appearing to Abram. I referred to Genesis 15, and that's when in Genesis 15, 2, Abram says, O oh, Yahweh God, uh, to the word of Yahweh. Um, as for the other thing you said, oh yeah, in Daniel 7, you said the Hebrew there actually indicates simply serving, not worship. Look at the context. Look at the, what the high priest says to Jesus when he cites Daniel 7. The high priest tears his robes and says, that's blasphemy because he knows that Jesus citing Daniel 7 is claiming to sit at the right hand of God and be worshipped. That's why the high priest tears his robes, which is forbidden by the Old Testament, tears his robes and yells blasphemy because he knows that Jesus Christ is claiming deity because he claims to be the Son of Man who is worshipped and sits at the right hand of the Father. Now, as for Isaiah chapter 7, the Hebrew word is Al Alma. There are two Hebrew words which can possibly mean virgin. That's Alma and Betula. Alma never in the Hebrew Bible refers to non-virgin. Betula sometimes does refer to non-virgin, so Alma is the best word that Isaiah could have used if he wanted to convey virgin. In fact, it is Jewish translators before Jesus Christ who translated Alma as virgin, and the context indicates that it is a royal figure, and for a royal woman not to be a virgin means she loses her royalty. So automatically, this clearly means that in the context of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it clearly refers to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And as a Muslim, I don't even know why you're asking this, considering you believe in the virgin birth of Christ. Yeah, <clears throat> that was a good point uh, by the brother. In Daniel 7, 
it actually says uh, by the brother. In Daniel 7, it actually says uh, Pela. I never brought this argument up because I wanted to grant it for the sake of argument. Even if we granted it for the sake of argument, it still backfires because of uh, Daniel receiving worship from the king. But the actual word is serve. It doesn't strictly mean worship. And what do we know about the Messiah? The Messiah will have his own kingdom. He will be a king. So naturally, people will serve him. And that's what the Jews believe about the Messiah. It's an earthly kingdom on earth. And that's what it means in context that the Messiah will be served in Daniel. I'm off the mic. Okay. Is this better? Can you hear me now? Mic check? Okay, great. There has been a lot of talking of uh, back and forth about um, the context of John. Let's go to the context of John. I have a question for Sami about John 12. This is what John says. This is what John believes about Yeshua, okay? For this reason, this is John 12, verse uh, 40 through 41. For this reason, they did not believe because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts. So, wait one second. Can you please just stop the text? So they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts. And I would heal them. Now, this is what John says. Isaiah said this because he, sa he saw Yeshua's glory and spoke about him. Now, where does John quote from? He quotes from Isaiah 6. Who does Isaiah see there? This is what Isaiah 6 says. In the year of the death of Uzziah, I saw Adon... Okay, I'm on the mic. Uh, his time was uh, over. But anyway, you brought up, uh, yeah, one minute to ask you a question. You brought up um, John chapter 12. Let's read it from verse 37. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord who has believed our message and to whom the arm of the Lord for this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and denied their hearts. Indeed, he was showing them the miracles, the signs, and they still rejected him as their Messiah. They wanted to kill him. So I agree, even after his signs and miracles, they still were unsatisfied. And that's what John chapter 12 is saying. And Isaiah 6, the verse you are going to bring up, I mean Isaiah chapter 6, says uh, nothing about God coming to earth. Rather, it's a, it, rather, someone is talking to God and saying, who shall I send? So if you were trying to put it with the context of Isaiah 6, that wouldn't help your case neither. Isaiah 6 says nothing about a God-man coming to earth in the flesh. If that, was, if that was what you were trying to get to. It doesn't. So, according to John 12, and why don't we go to John chapter 13? In John chapter 13, John claims that the Father had given Jesus all things. Talk about context. And I am looking at the context, Thomas. When I quote John, the ending of his gospel, which says, I want you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Exactly. I'm putting all of the context together. That's what he wanted to preach. Not that Jesus was God. And I'm off the mic. Okay, so Mr. Zatari says that was the context. He didn't want to preach that Jesus was God. Then explains John's statement in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He says it explicitly right here. The Word 
was God. Jesus was God. It's as clear as it possibly can be. Uh, and I don't really have anything to say about the question that was asked because I don't see the relevance. But I do have something to say about the prophet Daniel. The context indicates the worship here is actually worship offered to God alone because the Son of Man is sitting at God's right hand, which as I've noted is the source of Yahweh's power and authority. Therefore, the Son of Man claims to share in Yahweh's authority. You say that because the Son of Man is given stuff, that doesn't mean that he's eternally had them. As I've noted, Richard Baucom, no, noted biblical scholar, notes that the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic here indicate that it is an eternal exaltation, not a temporal exaltation. That is, the Father is eternally exalting Jesus Christ over all things. So he's simply misusing the text here. And as that guy back there didn't know Arabic, you don't know Greek like Richard Baucom does. So, yeah. Okay, um, can I get a mic check? The Q&A is officially over. I don't know if you guys want to continue. The 20 or the 30 minutes are up. Uh, it's up to you guys if you want to continue or... Okay, uh, Kabang, what do you want to do? Do you want to continue or just uh, end it right now? Okay, I'll give you back the mic. Uh, don't worry, I'm not trying to use this to argue. I'm just saying that I cannot stay any longer because tomorrow I am going on vacation at 4 in the morning, so I need to get some rest. But uh, it's been a great debate. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, Mr. Zatari, for that debate, and thank you, everyone, for attending.